so we're going to start with this uh, man who is uh, severely bothered by his symptoms despite taking uh, an alpha blocker. Déjame lotis, por favor. The urethra is a little bit tight huh? on the on the scope, so I'm going to do a notice. What is your throttle me? It's a normal urethra, but it doesn't have the caliber to allow uh, the scope comfortably. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do an os mild Otis urethrotomy. It's a uh, the Otis urethrotome is a device that makes a cut in the urethra anteriorly. You see at 12 o'clock it cuts the mucosa and that gives uh, the urethra a much uh, better caliber. Vamos a dilatar, ¿eh? Es que está muy estrechita. No sé si usar el de 24 con este señor también. Sí, sí, mejor. Quizá con el de 24 no hace falta dilatar mucho, ¿sabes? Vale. Vamos allá. Es que hay una zona ahí un poquito más... Voy a dilatar un poquito y cambiamos, ¿eh? Venga. Ahí está. Eh, ¿Me lo da con...? Démelo sin la óptica. Ya tengo óptica aquí. Vale, ya está la cámara puesta. Ok. Muy bien. All right, so... Oh. So, we have uh, downgraded the scope also. We are using a 24 French. Huh? So I did a notice uh, urethrotomy. And uh, now with the 24, you see the... It's much easier. So it, it won't cause any any uh, forcing of, of the urethra. That's the sphincter, and that's the prostate, which has a bulge here, a middle lobe. Huh? And uh, there we go. So we are going to introduce the fiber, and we will be starting in no time. Huh? So Otis, I think, I used to work with uh, Tony Mundy in, in uh, London, I went there for a year to learn uh, how to do urethroplasties and reconstructive urology and he told me Otis is a good thing. Eh? So I, I remember that. I remember that and uh, also there was a, a Spanish urologist who inspired many of us. Uh, who was uh, recommending uh, its use. Uh, he was doing uh, TURP. He used an amplat uh, sheath in the bladder to resect the big, big glands. And he would always say, I don't have a high incidence of strictures because I use the Otis urethrotone. And uh, maybe you know the name, that was uh, Dr. Valdivia. He's uh, known internationally for his uh, role in the development of supine uh, percutaneous uh, surgery for stones. But he was also a great uh, resectionist. He was able to resect very large glands and he would use this uh, suprapubic amplats so he could resect and resect and the pieces of tissue would go, would go into the bladder and out through the amplats uh, sheath. And I, I followed his advice, I think. And I have to say that uh, using the Otis liberally, which means that whenever I find that there is some, let's say, discrepancy between the size of the scope and the size of the urethra, I think that you can really uh, prevent uh, postoperative strictures. But when I say a mild Otis, I mean I'm doing a very gentle uh, let's say dilatation of the urethra so I open the otis until it contacts with the wall I'm not doing a lot of pressure 
because I want to do a mucosal cut on the urethra. The idea is that if I do a longitudinal lesion of the urethra, this will not cause a stricture. Even if there is a post-operative scarring, it will not heal uh, scarring circumferentially like a stricture. It will do a longitudinal scar on the anterior part of the urethra. So that's, that's the idea. Whereas if you do uh, traumatize the urethra with a very tight scope, it's likely that the patient's going to have a uh, circumferential uh, tendency to, to stricture. Okay, I did a mechanical, a little bit of mechanical dissection of the plane here. You see, that's the beautiful plane. That's a beautiful plane. That's the one we love to see. But it is not uh, always uh, possible to see such a beautiful place, plane. Sorry. So this is the line of attack. Here you see that we went a little bit further down the pl than the plane, but just by a millimeter. So no worries there. And uh, here I am just following the white line. As always, we uh, split the screen in two parts. In the middle, we have the line of attack. In the upper part, we can see the uh, prostatic adenoma. In the lower part, we can see the capsule. The fiber goes in about a third of the screen, maybe. And this is my favorite, let's say, working uh, situation. I put the fiber at 12 o'clock because I think it helps performing a very comfortable enucleation. And I keep it there for almost all the operation. I just did the original white line using the uh, fiber at 6 o'clock because it's more difficult to go up there with the fiber at 12 o'clock. And here you can see the, the white line. We developed the posterior space and you can see now that the apex has been liberated from the, uh, let's see, there's some bleeding coming from here. Let's see if we can stop that. Well, there's a little bit of bleeding, coastal bleeding mainly. Huh? So now to, to, to release the anterior part, I'm going to do my incision here on the prostate, on the prostate, following the white line, trying to, trying to cut the fibers that are joining the apex to the sphincter. And then once this is done, uh, I don't mind cutting here, you see a little bit, because it gives me access, it gives me access, and it releases the sphincter from the apex. So we can then follow the, the proper plane to uh, develop the, the right plane and release the apex from the posterior to anterior. Huh? So I'm coming up, up, up. Of course, here you want to come out and see what's going on here. Again, it's better to cut a little bit under the sphincter. You see, I'm cutting here under the sphincter, very horizontally up here because I want proper access first. Huh? So now when we have access, and we can uh, gradually separate the sphincter from the apical tissue, then we're going to look for the, for the good plane anteriorly. Huh? So this is the ascending dissection from one side. We can try to beautify it a little bit more, let's say make it more perfect by uh, going a little bit deeper inside up here. And this is what we call the early apical liberation. Huh? To me, there are two important factors to protect the sphincter and to prevent uh, postoperative incontinence. Uh, and that is one, to preserve the mucosa of the sphincter and two, to uh, liberate the apex as soon as possible in the operation because this will limit the amount of traction that uh, the sphincter is going to have. Huh? So here again, this is the line of uh, the white line. Here I'm cutting on the tissue following that white line deepening a little bit into the adenoma. I don't mind, you see, because this is a sphincter, this is adenoma, 
I'm just separating those, separating those, so I have a better access to the rest of the the plane now. You see, and uh, the fact that I did this cut allows me to enter there with uh, comfort without uh, putting traction on the sphincter or its mucosa. There we go. Again. I think you might find these videos a little bit repetitive in the sense that I'm repeating these same, let's say, ideas once and again, but I think it's important to watch many cases before trying to do it on your own. It's important to see how it works in different prostates and uh, it's important to see how planes not always look the same. I would say that uh, Many times uh, they don't. So here you see we are under the sphincter and this is a nodule. So I'm going to cut initially here to separate. I keep horizontal. You see this is fibers at 12 o'clock. And as we enter in a deeper, let's say, layer, then it's easier to, 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 to follow the plane. And it's also safer for the sphincter, huh? which is what we want to preserve at all costs. Uh, recently, I saw uh, in Twitter a comment by uh, Felipe Figueiredo. Felipe is a Brazilian neurologist and he's very, very uh, keen and very, uh, let's say, obsessed with uh, Holip as we are, all are. And I have to say that he, he does a lot of work reading papers and uh, remembering them and bringing them up and I think he's he's a brilliant star from Brazil and uh, he was saying that uh, there was some Chinese or oriental let's say paper uh, highlighting how it's very important to preserve some of the anterior tissue uh, at the apex uh, for continents he was uh, referring to this article and saying, why don't they translate these very important articles? Well, I have to say, I don't preserve any amount of tissue anteriorly at the apex, or I, at least I don't try to. And I, I have excellent continence. So I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of things that we think or we defend or we express about Holep and what we think about it that is not really scientific. Huh? It's based on expert, let's say, opinion. And you know that expert opinion is the lowest uh, grade of uh, quality of evidence, scientific evidence. So it's uh, probably just an opinion. Huh? We have to take it that way. So. One important thing, I think, when you do these operations and in general in life, huh, we have to listen to experts, but of course you have to make up your own mind with your own experience and what you, what you think. Of course, an expert usually knows a lot, but uh, the experience doesn't mean that he's always right, that his ideas are always uh, right. Also, I have to say that there are different kinds of experts. Huh? Some experts are experts because they are operating loads of patients every day, every week, very high volume, you know. These are the, let's say, surgical experts. Huh? These are guys who are very well respected by other colleagues because they have developed uh, the quality of uh, I mean, when they operate, uh, they simplify things. They, you can see things very clearly. You, you can see how they anticipate problems. And uh, so they, it's, it's a total joy to, to watch them operate. And of course, they have a lot to offer in the sense that their surgical experience uh, is based on many mistakes, you know. They say that an expert is someone who has committed all impossible mistakes and uh, they have learned by repetition and this is one kind of expert uh, and and then there are other experts that 
probably base their expertise on the fact that they get invited to congresses, they get they publish uh, some studies, they get some prestige because of this or that, or they're very good speakers, or they know the literature very well, and uh, they can quote, let's say, the most important papers, and so they are respected because of that. But uh, still, there is a big degree of uh, disagreement between experts in certain aspects. Huh? So, and everything we say, huh? if I consider myself an expert, uh, everything we say, I think, has to be uh, questioned, let's say, for the sake of, of keeping a scientific uh, mind. Huh? And also, you have to let's say, take the, the advice that works uh, well for you. Huh? So uh, I'm not convinced that this preserving the anterior tissue near the sphincter, I mean, some people who do the three-lobe technique, they make an incision at 12 o'clock, but they start the incision one or two centimeters inside in order to preserve that tissue. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that that's the key to, to, to uh, post-operative continence, immediate continence, and uh, the rate of uh, post-operative stress incontinence. Huh? Okay, so here I'm having a little bit of trouble, let's say, connecting both sides. Uh, there must be some tissue up here uh, that I'm not able to cut for the moment. So here you have to be patient as long as we are in the white region, you see. We are in the white, white region, so it's safe. Uh, the sphincter is uh, way back. Okay, so as I said, some people think this piece of tissue anteriorly, this piece of BPH tissue has to be, let's say, respected anteriorly near the sphincter. In my opinion, that's not necessary, and uh, I believe that it's more important to preserve the mucosa. Also, you know, it is difficult to it is difficult to, to to negate your training. You know, if you had a mentor who was your teacher and he taught you this is important, this is important, this is important, it's difficult for you to say to question that. You know, so many people just inherit inherit their knowledge and they defend that because this is what they learned, this is what they do, and they probably never question that anymore. Uh, so why, why, why did I, let's say, think that the in-block approach was good or better? Well, I, I started in a different way than most uh, Holip surgeons. I started by doing green light, green light enucleation. Uh, I was a little bit frustrated by green light vaporization and I wanted to give a better, let's say, uh, service to my patients uh, trying to remove the, the adenoma down to the surgical capsule and we developed the anatomic vaporization initially but then we moved on to do more and more hybrid cases where we would enucleate the middle lobe and then vaporize the lateral lobes and then they, we moved on to, to, to green light, huh? green light enucleation of the prostate. And to me, the most striking thing was that with uh, GreenLab doing an early apical liberation and block technique, we didn't get incontinence postoperatively. It was very low rate of incontinence. So I, I started believing that this was really important to, to liberate the apex early, to preserve the mucosa. You can, if you, if you watch uh, the GreenLab videos in my, in my channel, you can see how beautifully the apex is uh, developed very early in the operation. Uh, and then, of course, I thought this was a definite advantage. And I thought that you could only do that with uh, side firing fiber. But then, uh, learning Holep, because I thought if you want to be a good expert, you need to know, I mean, use different energy sources and get to know more. I started doing Holep and then I thought, Maybe I can do the, the, the in-block approach as well. Uh, there was 
someone who published a video on the EAU, there was someone, some oriental guy who published an in-block technique. So everything is invented before, you know, by the time we get there. But uh, I, I try to apply the same principle of liberating the apex early. And, and of course, this white line idea, marking the apex and then uh, releasing the mucosa early, I think, it's, uh, it was very, very important. I, I thought maybe there is no way to do this apical liberation with a straight firing fiber, but the truth is I, I learned how to do that. And I think these cuts that we do in the apex to liberate the apex from the sphincter, I think they're very, very important to, to liberate the, the sphincter and respect it beautifully. So, so that's the origin of, 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 of all this. Eh? Then we studied our experience with Holmium and Block. We compared this to Greenlap and we saw that we had even less incontinence with uh, Holep and Block because, of course, when you do Greenlap, you have to do a mechanical dissection of the plane all around the, the capsule, and uh, that probably means more traction. And uh, I think that's probably the, the cause for, for a longer, let's say, we had higher rate of postoperative stress incontinence with green lab and a little bit lost, longer lasting. So we decided to move to, to do this and block uh, early apical release holmium enucleation. And uh, you see, now most operations in this prostate is estimated as 60, 60 grams. It looks a little bit bigger to me, but all these operations, with a little bit of experience, uh, take you 40, 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. It's a very fast operation. It's very safe. As you can see, there's very little drama uh, involved. Today we have scheduled five cases in the afternoon session. So you can do many cases in a short time. And these patients will <laughs> have their catheter removed uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, it's now 7 p.m. here in Madrid. And uh, tomorrow morning at about 80, so in 12 hours, the catheter will be removed. And patients are able to go home the next morning. Now when we use Moses, I think we could shorten that. Uh, we are planning to do a study of a day case whole new nucleation in uh, patients with, uh, with BPH uh, because the hemostasis we achieve with Moses is slightly more reliable and patients do not need uh, postoperative irrigation and uh, probably we can take the catheter out they can go home. Huh? So we have this situation where we operate mainly in the afternoons. So we would have to change our, let's say, schedule to operate in the morning to be able to discharge the patients uh, later on during the day. It's been done in America and uh, there are more and more centers publishing their day case polyp experience. So I think it's a big, big, big step forward provided by Moses. Huh? Okay. There we are, that's the Adnoma, which is now very mobile, as you can see. Let's see if we can, uh, something happened that it moved. That's the bladder neck over there. So let's do this uh, posterior dissection until we get to the bladder neck. Here we have to get close to the Adnoma, as I always say, to, to release. And, uh, well, to me, I think it's been a very interesting journey where, as I said, my background was different from other surgeons. Many, many excellent surgeons learned the three, three lobe technique and performed it beautifully, never questioned it. But I think the principles of in block uh, uh, enucleation are solid, are very good. You know, you see a lot of centers publishing their new technique and their new experience. 
and uh, with a very funny name sometimes. This is our technique, this is the way I do it. But I think here we're talking about something more, uh, how would I say, more universal. I think the concept of starting by liberating the sphincter first, I think it's a very valid, valid concept. The concept of having excellent irrigation during the operation because we are irrigating a restricted space is very solid. It's very solid. And so I think despite this hasn't uh, maybe received enough attention for the moment, I think the message is strong and the more and more people are learning, learning this approach the more they do it, the more enthusiastic they are about it. Also, I have to say that in block approach is an approach that you can do with any source of energy. So you can do, here I'm pushing the abnoma into the bladder, initially one lobe and then the other lobe. So I try to flip the adenoma. You see here, here's the adenoma. Now going in the bladder, hanging from this small pedicle at six o'clock. So as I said, I think this is a, let's say, a step forward in the evolution of HOLEP. It's been facilitated by a different view, a different angle to, to enucleation. And uh, there it is. Uh, I think this is knowledge that everybody can use and can apply. Of course, not everybody will follow exactly the same steps, and that's okay because you develop your own preference, your own comfort with uh, different uh, approaches and maneuvers. But I think this end block approach has real merit. You know, you can you can discuss if a one lobe or a two lobe or a three lobe technique is good or not. But I think my personal view is that this is. Uh, possibly superior to, to all those uh, techniques in the sense that it's solidly, uh, I mean the, the rationale is solid and the results are solid as well. And uh, I'm trying to showcase this in the videos. Uh, the apical section can be tricky sometimes but systematically we can get uh, very good, a very good, uh, clinical result, a very good uh, clearance of the adenoma, good hemostasis, good view, fast operations and fast uh, recoveries of the patients. Okay, so we're going to get ready. Uh, this uh, 24 French endoscope allows me to second poquito que puede estar húmedo ahí dentro sí. allows me to use the morselator as well. Let's see if we see properly, yes. Now I'll change the light and I will connect the water. This is a Richard Wolf endoscope and it doesn't have the shark, uh, let's say, connectors. It's the old uh, model, but in uh, 24 French size, so more appropriate for patients with uh, tighter urethras. So now I'm distending the bladder while I introduce the morselator blade, bladder neck. So now we are in position, and initially you see there must be some water going in the, the pipes. And when they are full of water, then the suction from the vase in the morselator is transmitted to the tip of a scope and it astrates the tissue against the, the blades. So morselation can take place uh, very fast. This is another amazing development of uh, endoscopic enucleation of the prostate. I remember watching morselation was a pain, it would last one hour or more. Uh, now we can do morselation in minutes, which is a total game changer in endoscopic enucleation of the prostate.
because it transforms the nucleation in a, into a simple procedure. As I said, we, we do five cases today, which is uh, extremely efficient and because these procedures take 30, 20, 40 minutes, depending on the complexity, and allow for very fast uh, change of patients. They go home tomorrow morning. The hospital is quite happy because uh, the, the revenue from the hospital comes mainly from the use of the operating theater. So they, they don't like operations where uh, patients have to stay for a long time in the hospital using a bed which is in, in our country is paid uh, much worse than the operating room. So we have happy patients, happy nurses in the wards because they, these patients do not bleed. They do not you know, complicate uh, their lives with uh, big hematurias and the need to call for the specialists and like that, which was what happened when we did TURP. We have happy anesthetists. I recently posted a photo in Instagram of our operating room and the anesthetist was not in the photo and someone pointed that out. That's because he's probably sitting somewhere reading a newspaper because he's so confident that the patient's going to be okay. And there we are, that's the end of it. And this is the end of the operation. Let's See, there's a piece here. It's a small piece, but it could obstruct the catheter. And there we go. You see, there's, there's no anterior tissue. We, we just respected the sphincter. So I hope you enjoyed. If you watched all this, uh, you must be a very patient person. And I hope I didn't uh, bore you so much. Thank you very much. Okay.